Yeah, so I finished my PhD at the University of York um, last year and I'm now a postdoc at the Palm Island Centre where I'm writing up my first monograph, which is an incredibly painful experience. Um, <laughs> okay, um, on the 31st of January 1784, the little known blue stocking Mary Hamilton attended an evening gathering at the London home of the famous uh, artist and diarist Mary Delaney. Among the guests were the Duchess of Portland, uh, whose famous collection of antiquities and natural his history specimens is the focus of my new book, uh, and where Hamilton spent the preceding weeks working with her patron in sorting and cataloguing objects. Also present was Hamilton's uncle, the royal envoy to Naples and famous antiquarian Sir William Hamilton, who had returned from Italy to London just weeks earlier, following the death of his first wife, uh, Catherine, uh, his second wife, Emma Hamilton, being the more famous of the two. Mm -hmm. uh, writing afterwards in her diary, Mary Hamilton reported how, during the course of the evening, the Duchess went out of the room and sent for me in the most handsome manner and made me a beautiful and fine present, a dalge gamete, she styled it. This was a watch and chains of the newest fashion, the chain of silk, decorated with tassels and other ornaments of steel, gold, and pearl beads, with a seal and other trinkets suitable in elegance. This extraordinary gift uh, from the Duchess was in fact meant as a commemorative token of Hamilton's services in negotiating the sale from Sir William Hamilton uh, to her patron, the Duchess, of this. Uh, a Roman figured vase, then known as the Barberini, now known as the Portman Vase. Despite its already well-established fame in Britain, the transfer of the vase was executed in secret, and the watch given to Hamilton was no doubt a reward for her discretion and skill in manoeuvring negotiations between both parties. Days later, on the 5th of February 1784, Hamilton wrote again in her diary, uh, my uncle and the Duchess settled about the vase entirely. The Duchess made him give her an impression of his arms to have a seal cut for me for the watch that she has given me. This physical conjoining of the Duchess's gift with Sir William's arms provides compelling evidence of uh, Hamilton's role in bringing both parties together. As the embodiment of their collaboration, the watch would be visible to all, and yet remain the private expression of intimate and discreet thanks legible only to those in her closest circle. The Duchess of Portland's association with the vase has been routinely uh, dismissed and discredited by chroniclers of its history, whilst uh, Mary Hamilton's role in leading these negotiations between her uncle and the Duchess in the winter of 1783 into 1784 um, has been almost entirely overlooked. Instead, an oft-rehearsed uh, and factually incorrect narrative uh, of the vase um, Sorry, but the vase was named after the Dukes of Portland, who owned it from 1786 to 1945, has taken hold. Uh, and even today, the display text that accompanies um, the vase in the Roman Gallery at the British Museum does perpetuate this myth, although um, the online catalogue of the BM does give a much more thorough um, history of, of this object. Um, one possible reason for the early removal of the Duchess from the vase's story is the secrecy that surrounded its sale. Uh, as Josiah Wedgwood noted in his later 1788 account of the bars, I quote, uh, by Sir William Hamilton it was disposed of into the late Duchess uh, Portland's collection, but with so much secrecy at her grace's request that she was never known, even by her own family, to be the possessor of it. Mm -hmm. uh, in this paper I want to turn to an archive of previously um, unknown letters between uncle and niece, uh, as well as similarly neglected diary entries from Hamilton, um, all of which are kept now at the John Rylands Library at the University of Manchester. Uh, to reveal a crucial and otherwise uh, overlooked moment in the bars of history, one shaped by contemporary ideas of antiquarian work and gender, private and public identities, familial, intellectual, artistic, and sociable collaboration. 18th century interest in the bars was twofold. Uh, firstly, in the bars itself. Within this, uh, we might think about um, its Roman history. So the vase was buried in the tomb of the Emperor Alexander Severus and his mother Julia Mamea, uh, who were assassinated together very brutally in 235 AD. Uh, we might also think about its archaeological history. It was excavated from their tomb at Monte Dobrano outside Rome in 1582. Beyond this uh, was interest in the vase's history as a collected object uh, and its movement through various European collections, and also the elusive meanings of its decorative scheme. Within antiquarian circles, this was the subject of heated debate, um, and indeed continues to engage scholars um, today. 
In 1786, the Gentleman's Magazine reported on, quote, the inconsistent ideas of our modern antiquarians concerning the application of this monument. Its material qualities were um, equally mysterious to those in the 18th century, and although now it's uh, known that the vase is in fact made of glass, um, materials including basalt and alabaster were suggested, which now seems quite baffling. Um, as well as this interest in the vase as an object, uh, was its, a focus on its potential for reproduction and dissemination via sketches, prints, written descriptions, uh, and to scale replicas such as those most famously made later on by Josiah Wedgwood. Uh, prints such as uh, this one produced in the 17th century uh, and this later one um, which was uh, commissioned by Sir William Hamilton actually uh, were regularly made uh, and used by collectors and artists alike. For Sir William and his circle the vase was an important and unique monument in the ancient world which had the potential, potential to intervene favourably in British art and became co-opted into nationalist discourses. By 1782, Sir William had seen the vase um, in James Byers' showroom in Rome and could not resist buying it. Uh, later, he described his impetuous uh, purchase uh, to Wedgwood, and I think this is probably uh, behaviour we can all recognise. Uh, he says, The person I brought it off in Rome will do me the justice to say that the superior excellence of this exquisite masterpiece struck me so much at first sight that I eagerly asked, Is it yours? Will you sell it? He answered, Yes, but never under a thousand pounds. Soon after um, this purchase, William's, uh, Sir William's ambitions for Vars' use in uh, furthering a British school were tempered with the need to recuperate what transpired, transpired to be a significant financial expense. Whilst in March 1784 he presented the Vars uh, for inspection at the Society of Antiquaries, he had in fact already sold it in secret to the Duchess of Portland, thus recovering some of his money. Although he continued to cultivate his association with the artefact publicly, uh, and in early 1784, he was suffering. Sorry, in, in, in early 1784, he was already suffering from increasing anxiety uh, about the vase's material fragility and the implications and responsibilities of possessing such a famous object. Uh, turning increasingly, as we shall see, uh, to his niece Mary for practical support in his endeavour to rid himself of it. Prior to his return to London, Sir William's relationship with Mary Hamilton was rooted in epistolary and material culture, particularly in the exchange of antiquities. Writing from Naples in November 1782, after the death of his first wife Catherine, he declared in a letter, I have set aside for you an antique ring which was constantly worn by poor Lady H, and uh, which I will send to you uh, by the first opportunity. Such items, simultaneously antique and personal, uh, ancient and immediate, bodily and scholarly, served to transcend and revision the boundaries between uncle and niece. Hamilton was invited to take up the responsibilities that had previously been her aunt's, in attending to Sir William's social needs. Before leaving Italy, Sir William confided in her, I hope it is needless to assure you, my dear niece, you are in possession of my sincere affection and that you will ever find in me a true friend. By Sir William's arrival in Britain in 1783, and with him many of the items in his own collection, including bars, Mary Hamilton was uniquely positioned within an influential group of people that included Horace Walpole and Joshua Reynolds whose expertise and tastes her uncle fully intended to harvest in order to promote and ultimately sell the vase. Interest in Sir William's collection ignited um, immediately, evidenced um, in this fascinating letter dating from November 1783, uh, in which a servant of Horace Walpole's uh, writes to the blue stocking salon hostess and Hamilton's friend, Elizabeth Vesey, um, he writes, Mr. Walpole will certainly wait on Mrs. Vesey tomorrow, but with all his regard for her, he hopes he she will not interpret it as a visit solely for her sake. Uh, in a later edition by Vesey, um, she has terrible handwriting at this point in her life at, at the bottom, um, which was uh, recycled and sent on to Hamilton, uh, Vesey declares, I will not be convenient to you, madam, if you do not invite Sir William Hamilton, who all my friends are so fond of, I expect you will make us acquainted. The letter makes plain the systematic networks of social organisation um, that Hamilton operated within, as well as his centrality in scheduling her uncle's social calendar. By the winter of 1783, knowledge of the Vars' presence in London had reached the Duchess of Portland, who began to seek out Sir William for further discussion. In December, he wrote to his niece, who was staying at the, uh, as a guest at the Duchess's country house at Bulstrode Park, as soon as the Duchess comes to town, I will wait upon her and show her the vase, which I dare say her grace is eager to see. 
By the end of the month, the Duchess had taken up with a winter residence in her uh, vast London townhouse in Privy Gardens, Whitehall, uh, accompanied by Mary Delaney and Mary Hamilton. This was a busy period in the life of the Portland collection. Hamilton's diaries from these weeks uh, are filled with references to cleaning, sorting, uh, viewing and organising the cabinets of shells and other natural history uh, curiosities that were held in the house. Uh, certainly it was a time of intense collecting and curatorial activity for the Duchess, and it's within this context that the vase entered her collection. On New Year's Eve 1783, Hamilton went with the Duchess and Delaney, travelling across uh, the cold wintry city by coach from Whitehall to Sir William's lodgings in a hotel in King Street, St James's, which I think is a couple of streets in that direction, um, in order to view the vase for the first time. In her diary, uh, she describes uh, how the Duchess was already there, um, saw the fine vase, etc., stayed there till half past three o'clock, and the Duchess and I went home with Mrs. Delaney, and she puts in parentheses, uh, Mrs. D's eyesight so well again that she saw the vase. For the Duchess and her friends, the vase was visually and bodily enlightening. In Delaney's case, it literally enables her eyesight so well again that she sees the vase, emphasizing its effectiveness as a restorative object, and its aesthetic power in provoking corporeal as well as intellectual response. Um, 18th century visual culture of antiquarian and, antiquarian and connoisseurial activity regularly designates this sort of work as overtly masculine and sexualised, often showing old men lasciviously peering at fleshy forms rendered in ancient marble. Practitioners are often shown, as in the Rawlinson on the right here, uh, aided in their supposedly discerning sight with ocular devices um, that proved uh, almost infinite opportunity for satire, um, and there's a really great um, article on those. Um, however, in Hamilton's accounts, Delaney's vision is not piercing or perverse, but rather is itself restored by a physical encounter with the vase, instead of being the object of a culturally specific and obliquely performative voyeurism. Uh, under the gaze of Delaney, Hamilton and the Duchess, the vase becomes imbued with a power to, in turn, empower its onlookers. And what's, what I think is a really interesting, I think fair to surmise, fairly gendered reading of this encounter. Discussion of the experience as bodily and emotionally transformative continued when the next day Delaney wrote to Hamilton of the viewing, the calm, delightful society of yesterday, not forgetting the vase itself, did me more good than freezing fingers can express. Beyond this small group present at the first intimate viewing, the Duchess's interest in the vase remained a secret, uh, maintained by Hamilton's complex practical and social manoeuvring. In a fascinating passage in her diary, she describes a particularly uh, memorable gathering in which she, as the only possessor of all this information, um, is drawn into, I think, quite a farcical series of miscommunications that, written later in her diary, take on a sort of literary character, um, reflective of Hamilton's perception of herself as a central node in these negotiations. Um, so, whilst visiting Delaney at her home on the 3rd of January, um, 1784, with Hester Chiffon, who was a writer of conduct books and a fellow uh, member of the Blue Stockings, Hamilton receives what she describes as a secret message to me from the Duchess. Unable to speak openly or respond to the note, Hamilton describes biding her time, dining with friends, and afterwards looking over some prints. It soon transpires, however, that Delaney is involved in this intrigue. Hamilton writes um, that under the colour of getting me to look at a book, um, she took me to her bedroom and told me that what the Duchess wanted me to do, to purchase the bars for my uncle, Sir William. Next, Hamilton records in her diary, I wrote a note to Sir William to come to me, but he was out. No sooner had Hamilton done this than the Duchess, the Bishop of Exeter, and Sir William Musgrave came to Delaney's for tea. In a calamitous twist, Hamilton writes, my uncle, Sir William, also came without having received my message. <laughs> Hamilton, with her characteristic tact and intelligence, uh, waited until Chapone, the bishop and Musgrave had left before taking her uncle uh, down to the parlour under the pretense of showing him the pictures and then told him what the Duchess wished about the bars. The next morning, Sir William wrote to his niece, I have been thinking much, my dear Miss Hamilton, upon what passed last night, and now I will open my mind freely to you on the subject and you may, may make use um, of what I write as far as you think proper indicating uh, not only Hamilton's discreet abilities as a broker of the deal, but also the potency of their material correspondence in opening channels of cognitive communication between uncle and niece. 
Hamilton's responsibilities in the sale continued until the end of January 1784, when, increasingly anxious to give up the bars to its new owner, Sir William wrote her, oh, sorry, uh, sorry, Sir William wrote her, uh, I think the enclosed receipt would secure the Duchess in any accident, uh, if any accident should happen to me before the bars is delivered to her grace. I had as soon wished the Duchess would keep the bars. I have daily plagues on the subject. The extent of Sir William's social and practical reliance on Hamilton is evident in her diary from the same day, in which she notes, his servant was to de deliver the bars into my hands, and her literal underscoring of into my hands carved into the page of her diary, testifying to her keen perception of her role as purveyor of the bars. In a final letter to Hamilton, Sir William declared, I am convinced that if the Duchess does make the purchase, um, her grace nor any of her family members will ever be losers, for such very capital and well-known pieces will always bear their full value. The truth of Sir William's words will be felt with acute and painful irony when, only after a year of owning bars uh, secretly, the Duchess of Portland died, leading her museum to be put up for auction uh, in the spring of 1786. Displayed at her Whitehall home, the Duchess's collection shifted from a private assemblage to the realms of public commercialism, as excited crowds of tourists and collectors alike flocked to bid on items. Um, so the accompanying sale uh, catalogue, which was titled The Catalogue of Portland Museum, um, this is the frontispiece from it, and you can see the Portland bars taking uh, centre stage there, uh, was published ahead of the auction and announced to widespread excitement uh, the inclusion of the bars as its penultimate lot. Um, so here I've got as well the final um, page from a surviving copy of the catalogue. Um, I've done an arrow to it, and that's the description of the bars. Um, and whoever owned this catalogue has inserted one of Cipriani's um, prints of the bars in a sort of extra illustrative um, practice. Uh, of the sale, Horace Walpole wrote, I have heard that Sir William's renowned vase, which had disappeared with so much mystery, is again discovered, not in the tomb, but in the treasury of the Duchess of Portland. Walpole's allusion to both the tomb and treasury of the Duchess captured a key element of the auction and its fiction of celebrity cultivated for um, the benefit of a paying public, namely the close relationship between the Duchess in death and her material possessions. A connection further underscored by the vase's historical connection to the Roman matriarch Mamea and its um, previous interment in, as the funerary urn inside her tomb outside Rome. One attendee of the auction, Lady Annabel Gray, reported seeing the vase in situ at the sale, uh, brace yourselves, where it was, and I quote, oddly hung up like a lantern above the stairs. You can hear the faint screaming of curators everywhere. Um, this dramatic display uh, was enhanced in the final moments of the sale, uh, which had lasted 38 days in total, when the Duchess's son, the third Duke of Portland, wrote, uh, won back the vase um, in a bidding war with several other people, including, I think, Horace Walpole himself. Mm -hmm. um, he'd previously known nothing about the vase, uh, and he had to buy it back for the fairly extortionate sum of 980 guineas, as noted in, the, I don't know if you can make it out, but the marginalia um, that someone's, someone's written into this one. Um, ensuring its continued presence uh, in his family's surviving collections and cementing the narrative of his ownership and its association with the male members of the family that continues to endure to this day. Thank you.